So uh, just as a reminder, you know, this is a Center for Indian Society event. It's also something that we're doing for uh, Data Privacy Day, um, which is a series of events all over the country, generally uh, toward the end of, of January, um, to, to recognize uh, the uh, privacy as an important uh, value and to highlight some of the work people are doing. So this is in connection to that, that national uh, event. Uh, and we're um, extremely excited to have Commissioner Julie Brill here and uh, on, her, on her West Coast tour uh, <laughs> has, uh, has, has made us a part of it. Um, and uh, of course, you know, she is obviously an FTC uh, Commissioner. Um, as many of you have had that appointment since 2010, yeah, which since puts April. you in April 2010, which puts you in September 2016. Um, so we'll have, we'll have you for a bit. Um, and of course, Commissioner Brill has a, a long history of uh, working in um, uh, consumer rights law at the state level, at the federal level, um, and uh, particularly in the areas of fair uh, 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 credit, of course, and financial privacy. Um, and then just as a, as a person who works personally in the fortunate space, um, has a <coughs> tremendous amount of respect from all quarters. Um, as a person who's extremely thoughtful um, uh, and diligent on, on privacy, security, and other, and other issues. So we're, we're really um, excited and honored to have, here, uh, have her here. Um, and the format today is just going to be a conversation, a few questions, and, um, um, and then maybe we'll be, get a chance to open it up uh, uh, to your questions as well. Um, but again, you're welcome and thanks so much for being here. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, let me just thank Please, you, yeah. uh, Ryan, for inviting me, and, and thank you to Stanford for hosting me. I am, um, it is one of, it's a whirlwind tour. I'm sort of talking to a lot of uh, groups and then individual companies and um, it's really great to be out here where so much is happening with respect to privacy, technological innovation, and um, you know, consumer consumer issues. So it's, it's really been um, incredibly educational to me and very helpful to me. So I'm very grateful <laughs> to be here. Yeah, well, we like the uh, East Coast West Coast uh, connection. Yeah, yeah. Not enough of it that uh, happens. Um, okay, so just to jump right into it, um, 2011 has been such a significant year for, for privacy in, in so many ways, um, especially with respect to the sort of mainstreaming of the ideas about privacy. And the fact that it's got sustained national coverage. Um, so that, that, that not just the sort of policy wonks like, like me, um, uh, but, uh, but folks, you know, um, around the kitchen table, uh, to, to, to borrow from the <laughs> previous election, um, are actually really thinking hard about this issue. Um, and so I guess I wanted to you know, pick your brain um, about what you think some of the more significant developments were of. So I would um, break that down into kind of policy initiatives and then law enforcement initiatives. So let's just talk about the po on the policy side. Um, I'd say over the past year, one of the biggest developments I've seen is an awareness and an attempt to try to address some of the potential concerns around what I call big data, the agglomeration of data from multiple sources to pull together profiles or information about consumers. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the benefits of that data and the potential for benefits in, in all sorts of areas, healthcare and others, and, and that's been incredibly exciting and, and powerful. And at the same time, I think there's a lot of discussion about what are some of the potential concerns and how should we be addressing some of those concerns. So, um, you know, one of the things that we did at the Federal Trade Commission, our, our um, effort wasn't focused on big data it, by any means, but it did have uh, some elements that addressed. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, that came off. I hope I didn't break anybody's ears with that. Um, so, one of the things that we, there we go, it's caught on the chair. One of the things that we um, have done. Uh, is issued a, a draft privacy report. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. It came out in December of 2010. And what we were doing through that report is trying to say to not only industry, but also to policymakers um, in Washington and elsewhere, how has the world modernized and changed in such a way that we need to be thinking about privacy in, in a different way or, or modifying some of the ways that we're thinking about privacy. So that was the intent of the report. And, and within that context, within the report, we um, probably most famously 
uh, uh, set out a call for um, industry as well as policymakers to consider developing do not track mechanisms. Again, it's one mechanism to give consumers simplified notice and simplified choice about some of the ways in which data is being collected and used online. But that wasn't all that we did in the report. I mean, the report wasn't solely designed to focus on a do not track, um, on the do not track proposal. We had some very broad um, proposals around privacy by design, you know, instituting practices from the very get-go in terms of the way products are developed and services are developed so that companies think about should we really be retaining, should we really be first collecting all this data? Should we be retaining it? How do we safely dispose of it? What are the other kinds of practices that we should put in place from the beginning that can deal with some of these important privacy concerns? And in that context, we talked a lot about the need for transparency and access and potentially some form of control depending upon the way data is, um, what kind of data is, is being collected and how it's being used. So that gets to the, you mentioned fair credit reporting, which is something that I've done a lot about. You know, that's a regime that we have here in the United States, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that focuses on particularly sensitive information, very detailed financial information that credit reporting companies have, that's used for very sensitive purposes. Employment, credit, housing, some of the, some issues that, you know, Congress has said, well, these are going to be sensitive uses. And in that context, consumers are given a right to know that the information is being collected, to access it, and to correct it. And so what we've said in the, the big privacy um, uh, report that we, that we put out in draft form is there may be other ways in which we need to bring those concepts of transparency, access, and correction or some kind of control into the database realm to, again, depending upon the use of the data and the sensitivity of the data. So, you know, do not track out a lot of attention, um, I think, in, in the blogosphere and in, in, within the news. But, but the report and what we're trying to do is say, you know, look, um, the world is modernizing and moving at a very, very rapid pace. And do we need to be bringing privacy concerns in a more realistic way to, 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 to the online world and to how um, information is actually being used and collected. So that was a big development last year. So what, would it be fair to say um, that um, a lot of the things that have come out this last year have added to the sort of toolkit available to a company or to a regulator or to, or to get us to the place we want to be in? In other words, do not track as a means to, uh, as an experiment, as a means to see if we can give consumers better control. Um, I, I wondered if I could just get you to react to this. I, mean, I always thought there was an interesting, um, uh, an interesting connection between some of the core um, privacy principles that the that there have been used to animate a lot of the FTCs uh, in my in my view work in privacy. Um, what is the relationship between access and notice? Because of course, if you give people access to their information, that gives them a better sense of what's going on. And in fact, it's even better because it's tailored to them in particular. Um, anyway, so I wonder if you could comment on, I mean, in the last year in your experience, how effective have these new tools been? So, uh, to a certain extent, there, uh, you know, the do not track developments that we've seen that have been that have been effectuated have been um, uh, developed by industry. Mm -hmm. They have not been developed legislatively. There were proposals to, to, to enact laws that, that, that ended up um, not, not really going, um, uh, they, they didn't get passed. They did get hearings and whatnot, but they didn't pass. So what we have are systems that have been put, put in place by industry itself. Um, you know, does it give us a tool or a hook? Is that is that what you're asking? You know, to the extent that promises are made and then are not lived up to, so to the extent a company says, we will not track you, or we will not collect your information in such and such way, and then they do. You know, that, that definitely is something that we could take a look at, and we have. Even outside of the do not track context, if an individual company, so do not track is really focusing on information that's flowing across websites, 
or from one entity to another entity, so that you're dealing with not first party relationships, but third party relationships. But even you know, on a, a first party relationship where a company has said, we will do X with your data, or we will not do Y with your data, and then it turns out that something else has happened, mm -hmm. and they, what, how do I say it? That they didn't do X, or they did do Y. Um, you know, that's something that we've always um, been able to proceed against, and, and, and would, uh, and, 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 and have. Um, so I think do not track, uh, you know, yes, it's sort of, it, it maybe has added some tools, but really I think what it's added is not so much tools for us, as it has added tools for consumers. And that's what it was designed to do. Not to really create law enforcement tools, but to give consumers information about, about what's happening to their data and some ability to, to make choices. So I want to pick up on, you had mentioned uh, some of the enforcement activity at the, at the FTC. Yes, right. um, and, you know, So uh, there have been a couple of really intriguing actions. I mean, uh, seemingly aimed at this, um, ensuring that consumers have control. So for instance, there was one uh, consent decree where the uh, complaint originally was that um, uh, someone had, had allowed you to opt out only to 10 days later opt you back in for exactly. instance, right? That's exactly what I was just referring to, right. for instance. Yes, yes. Exactly. So I wonder if there are there other uh, interesting enforcement developments that you want to talk about? Oh yeah, I mean, sure. that one was interesting. We've, so we, we've been really active over the past year or so in terms of enforcement, and probably the, the matter that has gotten um, a great deal of attention and in many ways could be considered the most significant would be the fa our Facebook settlement, which is still um, a proposed settlement. We're still collecting comments about it, and so it hasn't yet been finalized. It does come on the heels of a settlement with um, Google, as well as Twitter, although the Twitter case was a little bit different because it was more of a data security issue. But um, we now have um, either proposed or finalized settlements with you know, many of the major uh, social media that are out there. And um, I think Facebook, um, and to a certain extent the Google uh, settlements or proposed settlements, are significant because um, for the first time, uh, we are calling on companies as a corrective measure for problems that have existed in the past that we've mapped and where we've brought action. We are calling on them by decree, by order from us to institute a comprehensive privacy program. Um, we have done that in the data security area where, where a company has had data security problems. We have called on those companies to institute comprehensive data security programs. This is really the first couple of times where we've called on companies to institute comprehensive privacy programs. So for instance, having in place um, you know, personnel who are primarily responsible for privacy, having in place governance structures throughout the, the entity, the, the corporate entity, that are thinking about privacy. We also put in place um, auditing requirements or assessment requirements that last for 20 years. So these, these entities are now subject to having a third party come in, work with them, and, and assess or audit the success of their privacy program. That's a pretty significant development, um, which we haven't done in the past. Yeah, especially as it involves, you know, arguably three of the biggest players. And I mean, that's just you're reaching a lot of consumers. Exactly. But, but we, did, we and right, and so that's another reason why it's very significant. It's, it, and actually, these orders apply worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, so there, it's not just the U.S. users of Facebook and Google, but it's actually applying to all you know, their, their company-wide programs. Um, but we also have brought some small, some cases that are maybe small by the number of consumers, mm -hmm. but actually also represent some pretty significant developments or or reminders to industry that they have certain obligations that they might um, not have been aware of. Uh, so for instance, in the mobile app space, um, we have brought uh, cases where um, app developers had said they were gonna do something with data and then did something different with data um, or made promises but, but, but um, you know, didn't abide by them. I think there's a, you know, the app community, the develop, app development community is so um, dispersed and differentiated, heterogeneous, I think was a word that you used um, this, this morning. More than once, I'm very Yeah, it's, it's extremely <laughs> heterogeneous, violently heterogeneous, so that, um, you know, I think the message getting out to many of the folks in the app, the mobile app community, that they are subject to FTC jurisdiction, 
um, that when they make a, uh, when they say that they're going to do something with consumers' data, there's someone watching who might bring a, an enforcement action against them. That was a pretty significant development. Um, another area where we've um, been very active is in children's privacy. Children, we we um, also use not only the broad-based unfair and deceptive acts and practices law, which is part of the Federal Trade Commission Act. But we also have a number of sectoral laws that we enforce. One of them is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, and we brought some significant cases there. We're also proposing rule modification in the children's um, online privacy space, so um, another significant trouble. So we've talked a little bit about um, industry developing, industry developing certain um, you know, some new tools. Um, I'm not, you, know, you didn't say this word, but um, aggressive or a minimum active enforcement by the Federal Trade Commission. And then you mentioned the fact that um, there have been a couple of bills in Congress that didn't end up um, going anywhere last year. Um, I mean, do you have any thoughts about the role of Congress in, all, in, in this ecosystem? Uh, sure. I mean, Congress um, is uh, very, very interested in privacy issues. I and mean, there are some members of Congress um, who uh, have been long interested in, in, in privacy. Um, there's been a privacy caucus within Congress, and they, they hold uh, meetings and, and have discussions. In fact, the chairman, John Leibowitz, the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, and I recently attended a privacy caucus um, uh, breakfast meeting. And it's a bipartisan um, caucus. It's not just one side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle, which um, you know, I have always thought of privacy, data security, and, and frankly, a lot of consumer protection as being a nonpartisan issue. And to a certain extent, privacy um, has lived up to that and continues to live up to that. Um, I, I, Congress, um, a lot of members of Congress will write bills and will introduce bills, and then hearings are held. And when a hearing is held on a privacy issue, it brings attention to the issue. Um, so there have been hearings, for instance, on data security and whether or not there should be a, a data security and data breach notification law enacted at the federal level. There obviously are state laws on that issue, but the questions that Congress has been asking is, should we have a federal law? So hearings are, are, are a time when all sorts of um, uh, players, us, we at the FTC, the state regulators, as well as industry and consumer advocates can come together and talk about that issue. Um, similarly, there was the Kerry McCain bill, which was an attempt to create a broader um, privacy law here in the United States. There was a draft or a broader privacy law. Hearings are held around that. It's a very useful time for entities to come together, for stakeholders to come together and talk about these issues. Um, so I think Congress plays a very important role in the develop the discussion. The dis so even, even outside of enacting laws, I mean, obviously, they're, they're most, they're, one of their most important roles is to enact a law and, and set standards and things like that. But, but out, even outside of that, just having the discussion, bringing the stakeholders together, and moving the conversation in whatever direction Congress thinks is appropriate is actually a very uh, important function that they play. That they so um, one of the things that struck me about the um, um, Kerry McCain uh, bill, for instance, um, was that is it, is it in, announcing, in announcing this, this proposed legislation, uh, I think it was uh, Senator McCain referenced the What They Know series from the Wall Street Journal. Um, and, uh, and obviously there's been this um, you know, really sustained uh, you know, media attention to this issue. Um, you know, I, I wonder, do you, do you see that um, continuing in the 2012, and do you think it's had as big an impact as it feels like it's had? It, the, particularly the, the What We Know oh, series? Oh, just, just sustained coverage, yeah. I'm just gonna I, think it has, I think it has had a big impact. I mean, it, it's had a, look, privacy is one of those areas where, um, unlike loan modification fraud, unlike scams, uh, negative option billing, I mean, there's all sorts of scams out there where consumers might not know right up front what's going to happen to them, but they realize, you know, after a little while, gee, I've been scammed, mm -hmm. you know, and they can, they can send forward complaints and reg regulators at the state level and we at the federal level can then act on those complaints. Privacy is in one of those areas. Consumers often do not understand what's happening with their data. There are a lot of players out there who aren't consumer facing. Um, data brokers, for instance, they're just not even, consumers don't know who they are. Um, so I think in an area like privacy, uh, uh, 
the, the, the increased attention by experts, whether it's academics or whether it's folks um, in the media who really dived in, into this issue, has had a big effect and will continue to have a big effect. Do I expect that they'll continue to write about it? Yes. Because I think that these are issues that have really um, captured, a, as, you, as you said, you know, captured a segment of the population that really cares deeply about it. And then others who, who just want to know, well, what is happening? What is happening? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think so I do think it, I'm sorry, I do think it'll go forward. Yeah, I mean, it, as a person who, um, who studies the, you know, the, the space relatively closely, um, I learn every something every time I read one of these articles. Um, uh, we do too. <laughs> right. I'll, say, I'll say I do personally, and that's what I was trying to allude to. You know, if consumers don't understand it, we, we get our complaints, or we get our, our sources and, and, and uh, uh, leads for potential investigations from sources like this from industry comes forward and says, gee, you should know what my competitor is doing, mm -hmm. from academics. I mean, the, this is where, our, this is, the, these have to become our sources because consumers don't really understand what's happening. So just a, a, a you know, um, a pitch to everybody out there who's interested in the space. I mean, you can be useful to, to agencies. I mean, never, never think you can't be useful to agencies. They're always looking for, uh, in my experience, as a, 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 a sure, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> better than I, Absolutely. certainly. Um, I was looking for, for useful discussion. So let, let's sort of stay on the, you know, put our for, forecasting hats, uh, keep our forecasting hats on here. So I mean, what do you see as being some of the interesting or important developments that are right around the corner in this space? So um, I've mentioned that we came out with a draft report a year ago. We're going to finalize that. We took in, for those of you who just aren't familiar with the Federal Trade Commission and what our process is like, um, typically speaking, we will, in, in almost any effort, whether it's a consent decree or a report, we'll issue it for comment, and then we will receive comments and we'll analyze them very carefully before we come out with a final, finalized document or, or, or statement. In the case of the privacy report, the draft privacy report that was issued um, last year, uh, we um, received 450 comments. So we got a lot of interest and attention. Um, maybe for the entire nation that doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is a lot of comments because a lot of them are written by entities, you know, very, very big players in this space, groups of consumer organizations that come together and write one comment but are actually representing potentially millions of people. Um, and uh, so, so right now, what, what we've been doing over the past year is analyzing these comments and trying to decide what makes the most sense in terms of how we want to finalize our recommendations in terms of issues like notice, um, choice, uh, transparency, access. Some of the issues may be around first party, third party, and the distinctions there in terms of notice. Because uh, one of the things that we're thinking about is to simplify notice, um, we want to get rid of what we termed commonly accepted practices. That is, if consumers understand that when they order something on, say, Amazon, right, and they're <laughs> purchasing something, they, they know that their address and um, potentially some other information that they have an address usually is going to be given to a fulfillment company that will then ship the product to them. That's the kind of information that doesn't need to be in a privacy notice. So we're calling these things commonly accepted practices. What is it that consumers commonly understand and accept as a practice in terms of their daily usage? Now, it's very important to remember that what we're focused on is what consumers um, commonly accept, not what industry necessarily commonly accepts. So from a, it's from a consumer-facing perspective that we're looking at this. And there's been a lot of discussion in the comments we've received about what the edges of commonly accepted practices ought to be. So similarly, we talk about the need for notices to be heightened when we're in a third party context as opposed to a first party context. So if you're sharing information with other entities that the consumer isn't engaging with, um, or you know, you're or, or you're using information that comes from some other entity, that becomes a third party context. And again, the, the notices and choices that ought to be given to consumers we said in the draft report should be different and heightened as opposed to a first party context where consumers understand who they're dealing with. 
we got a lot of comments about that, about what, again, are the contours of appropriately defining first party versus third party. So those are the things we've been thinking about, and we're going to be um, issuing a final report uh, probably within the next few months. So that'll be, I think, a big area to come in the very near future. Another area I, wanted, I want to mention, um, because it is very big and important to us, um, is the mobile space. Um, what's happening with respect to mobile apps, what's happening with respect to notices on mobile devices, on apps. Do consumers actually understand what they're being told about how their, their, their data is being used? And then, of course, there are all sorts of issues around, well, what's the differences between what they're being told and how the data is actually being used? So there are issues there as well. But, but we're really you know, dealing with, in many ways, a different kind of beast because the ability to give consumers notices are, it's very different when you're talking about a handheld device versus, um, you know, a laptop or a PC. So um, I think that there'll be a lot, um, a, a, a greater attention to what's happening in the mobile space in the next year. Yeah, that's got to, that's got to be right. I mean, even if we were even talking about uh, screens on, on cars. And right. Cars, right? Um, right. So I mean, there's just an idea that uh, Baron uh, Skoka at uh, Tech Freedom has, has been talking about a little bit. I, I, I don't mean to react to this, I'm just, just putting it out there. Um, this notion that you could actually have sort of two tracks of notice, right? So notice to consumers that was simplified and more uh, more experiential, um, and then on the other hand, <coughs> more technical, fulsome disclosure um, to, to other things might be interesting. Anyway, I thought that. Well, well not commenting, because I, I haven't read his stuff, no, so no, I don't no, know exactly sure. what his. But just what we have said is something that we, we term it layered notices. Mm -hmm. um, the need to give consumers, and I think what you just termed consumer facing or whatever, but the need to give consumers upfront, potentially just in time, information that's easily digestible, that's in consumer language, as opposed to in legalese. So, you know, letting the marketers um, and the advertisers help develop these communications rather than the lawyers, right? This, this simplified notice that, that tells consumers up front the, the most important salient things that they need to know. And then underneath that, if consumers want more information, like, okay, what is, what is, they're saying they're collecting location data. What is location data? You know, we all in this room might understand what that is, but there might be a lot of people who really don't know what that is. So they can click and they can get more information. But then, and maybe more, you know, some more layers of it, but ultimately falling to or, or devolving to a more, much more fulsome legal um, document or, or document. I don't want to say legal document because we are trying to really move away from that. But a much more fulsome description of the privacy practices, and that would be the kind of document that academics could look at, students could look at, grad students could look at. And, and analyze it and actually do a lot of work. With. Right, because I think it's a common um, misapprehension that the only role of notice is to help consumers protect themselves and lose the market. I mean, uh, people like Peter Swearer, who we talked about this morning, have pointed out that um, if you're forced to write down what your privacy practices are, which is sort of California law, and I think arguably uh, um, law law is, is a best practice. Uh, then you have to do a kind of soul searching about what am I doing as a company, right? right. right. Um, and similarly, um, consumers are not the only people reading these notices. You're reading them. Right. The journalists are reading them. Absolutely. Them. Yeah. Absolutely. And having said that, you know, um, one of the aspects of, for instance, a case that you and I were talking about, like the Sears case mm -hmm. or, the, or the, the recent Facebook case, you know, just simply having something written down somewhere in a very complicated document um, we've taken the position that in appropriate circumstances, it will not absolve the company mm. of um, potential problems if consumers wouldn't have expected to find that very salient information in, in the place where the company put it. So that was one, one issue that came up in the Facebook matter, and it was an issue that came up long ago, or relatively long ago, in the Sears matter, which was a, a, a similar situation. Yeah. Um, well, I know we have uh, relatively limited time with you today, um, and so I wanted to open it up to audience questions. Um, the, the dean of uh, Colorado um, is uh, Phil, Phil Weiser, you know, you know yep, Phil, has this, uh, has this rule that, uh, that a student must ask the first question. And I think that we should, I think we should adopt that rule here. I think it's a great If that's okay with you. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and so I was hoping that uh, we could get a question from a student uh, somewhere in the university. It doesn't have to be the law school. Uh, any students have any questions? 
you know, and, and okay. just, that, that's great. And, and just, you know, if you want to ask, like, so what is the Federal Trade Commission? Yeah, what's a commissioner? commissioner? And actually, that would, that's totally, <coughs> totally within that. One thing we should do, actually, very quickly, and we'll get to your question immediately, is that um, one thing people don't understand is, um, the structure of the commission right. itself, that there are five commissioners and not all the slots necessarily full. Could right. you speak to that a little I'll, bit? I'll, I'll just do it really quickly because I think, you know, we <coughs> sometimes take for granted that everybody knows like everything about the alphabet soup that exists in Washington. You know, SEC, FTC, FCC, and, and most people um, have no idea what any of this means. The Federal Trade Commission was actually founded um, uh, uh, almost 100 years ago. It was a brainchild of um, Louis Brandeis, and it came out of um, concerns around trusts during um, the big um, you know, U.S. steel uh, debates. Um, even Those were even um, more than 100 years ago. And so the Federal Trade Commission was designed to focus on unfair methods of competition, and unfair and deceptive acts and practices. We were originally a competition agency. That was the first mission. And later on, about uh, 15, 20 years later, um, the, the consumer protection mission was added. A lot of other things we do, a lot of other more specific laws that we enforce. But that's kind of when I referred to before about sort of our, our overarching Bible, if you will, or you know, the founding um, principle that we enforce. It's this unfair methods of competition on the one hand, and unfair and deceptive acts and practices on the other. And we are run by, it's an, it's an agency that's run by five commissioners. Um, right now one, there's actually a vacancy, right. which is um, in the process of being filled. No more than three of the commissioners can be from one party. Uh, we <coughs> serve for a term of years. Uh, the full A full term is seven years. Um, so that's why my term goes through 2016. So whatever happens in, for instance, a presidential election that may be coming up, mm -hmm. I could still serve and still fill out my term. Um, and they're staggered terms. So the, the, the design of that, or the, the, the goal behind designing a system like that with commissioners is to have a bipartisan or multi-partisan review of the matters that we're looking at. It's a measure of independence. Uh, and definitely a measure of independence because once we're appointed, once we're, we're appointed the commissioners are appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and once we are confirmed, we're then in for that period of time, while Congress, of course, controls our budget, as they do with, most, with the vast majority of agencies, um, uh, they cannot remove us. Um, uh, I, I mean, I guess we could be impeached for something like that. I mean, in general, I mean, we can't, I mean I'm, sure there, I'm sure we can be removed for something or another, but we can't be removed for you know, political reasons. You won't, be, you won't be testing the limits of that. Well, I can yeah, see yeah. <laughs> something I didn't mention from Commissioner uh, Will's uh, uh, bio of many things she's done is also uh, taught at Columbia Law School. So you can see some of that coming out with the history of the uh, yes. yes. uh, yes. Sorry about that. It's hard to be pedantic. Not at all. That's what I meant. Um, but yeah, well, please, let's go to uh, Anadia's question. Please. Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess I'm not sure completely how much this is within the scope of the FTC, but you, you've talked a lot about the privacy and security of consumer data yeah. from other private actors. What about government actors? To what extent is that data being protected from government, or to what extent can notice be given of what data might be exposed to government actors and how that data can be accessed? So I'm going to repeat the question in case the video people that can't hear that. Um, the question, just very, very quickly, was um, to what extent do we at the Federal Trade Commission focus on use, collection, and choices around uh, government use of data as opposed to commercial use of data. Very quickly, I can answer that quickly, but I'll give a little bit of context. We don't really focus on that. We're really focused on the, cons the, the, the use of information about consumers in a commercial context, because that's our mission. Um, the, obviously, uh, there are lots of folks in Washington who are very interested in, and, and, and around the world, not just in Washington, they're everywhere around the issue of how government is using data, accessing data, et cetera. And um, the other day I was at a, a little talk and a fellow who um, had worked in the Justice Department asked me about my views on, on the discussion around government use of data. And you know, it, it, look, I come from a long background of law enforcement. I was in a, in a couple of state attorney general's offices for over 20 years. So I have a deep and abiding respect for law enforcement. 
And I think our agency, while we, you know, we don't do the government access of, of, of data for criminal you know, prosecution purposes, we respect and understand where DOJ is coming from and the need to access data in order to um, uh, ensure that we're safe. Right? Um, there's a lot of discussion about the limits of that and how it should be limited and how uh, uh, targets of investigations and third parties ought to be notified, et cetera. It's really not an issue that, that we get into. But, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a, um, a lot of discussion around those issues and how, for instance, data minimization and data retention. If, uh, from the commercial side, um, you know, from a, a consumer protection side, we're going to call for data minimization and no, and as little retention as possible. How does that then translate into the desires of criminal prosecutors who are going to say, "Well, we we want that data. It's attention." So just to, I'm going to build on that if you don't mind, which is that um, you know, sometimes the same tools and, and principles can, can end up being useful in the, in the commercial as in the you know as against the government context. And you notice this is a good example. I mean, today the there are, there's this electronic communications privacy act that, that is the guide for the circumstances under which uh, the government can get electronic data. It's very you know, uh, it's an oversimplification. Um, and the only way consumers know about it is because somewhere in privacy policy it says something like, um, we comply with lawful requests for your data, right? That doesn't tell you very much. Um, whereas some of the um, techniques that Commissioner Brill has mentioned about improving notice maybe would um, tell you when there's been, or require that you be told when there's been a request for your data, or give you a sense that because your data happens to be 181 uh, days old, suddenly now it's moved into a different kind of protection. So, um, you know, some of the same tools that could also be good question. Yeah, over here. Um, I, I apologize for this question's a little bit below your pay grade, uh, but as a, <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could both give us sort of a um, history of your trajectory from law school to the FTC, and also um, for if you have any advice for law students who are interested in consumer financial protection uh, and, and particularly government service and sort of the different balancing between private and public jobs. Um, so uh, again, just in case uh, someone was unable to hear the question, um, it's if it, it, there is no question that's below anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really. Um, I was asked, you know, how uh, to describe my trajectory. You know, what what got me here? How did I get to be a commissioner? And what did I do in my career path to get me here? And um, do I have any advice for law students um, who are interested in um, either consumer protection or consumer financial protection? I love answering that question. I actually come to law schools and just speak about that. Um, and that is something that, that um, is definitely worth, uh, you know, an hour or, or more to talk about. So I won't be able to, to do to do the, you know, what you can do with your career and your life as a law student once you leave to get yourself into a consumer protection protection trajectory or a public policy um, trajectory. But um, uh, I, I so I'll just tell you really quickly what I've done. Um, uh, I, after graduating from law school, I clerked for a federal judge in Vermont. Um, loved Vermont, but felt like I ought to get some large firm experience. <coughs> so I went to New York and worked for a large um, uh, New York law firm, Paul Weiss. Uh, did that for a couple of years. Went back to Vermont and started working for the Vermont Attorney General's office. I was first doing civil litigation, basically defending the state when it was being challenged um, for constitutional, unconstitutional issues and other issues like that, and, and defending some state agencies and doing some prosecution, like a, a real estate brokers and things like that. I mean, stuff that um, might be considered kind of small, but actually I loved it. I mean, I loved like doing those individual cases. And one of the great things about working in a state, at a state level or a local level, um, in law enforcement is you're going to get right out there. You're going to get right out there and start doing cases because nobody has the luxury to have you on a team of five attorneys where you're just carrying the bags. I mean, they, the uh, public service does, uh, do, or, you know, pu government uh, entities just don't have that kind of luxury. So you're going to get right out there and start doing cases, and it's a great, um, ex it's great background. It's great. It's a great experience, and I loved it. I then did a little bit in banking and insurance. I was general counsel of our state banking and insurance and got a real flavor for regulation and financial regulation, then started doing consumer protection work. I did that for a really long time in Vermont. Um, I then went to North Carolina and, and ran their consumer protection and antitrust.
program, um, which was which had almost as many people um, within that division as were in the entire Vermont Attorney General's office. So I was running a very big division. Um, and in Vermont, I, I, I grew to leadership positions too, but it's a very small operation. So um, I, and when I, and I was in North Carolina for about a year, um, while I was there, shortly after I got there, um, the White House called and asked me if I would be interested in becoming a Federal Trade Commissioner. Um, so I spent my entire career, oh, just about my entire career, focused on consumer protection issues. Um, there were some early years where I bounced around a little bit, but then I honed in and for a very long time worked on consumer protection and competition issues. So my advice, sorry this has gotten a little bit no, long-winded, but I probably at least half the audience is much more interested in this than the substance. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, you know, um, I really am a big believer in um, getting out of Washington, getting out of New York, I guess the West Coast equivalent is getting out of LA, I guess, or San Francisco. <laughs> But going to a local area, an area that's you know kind of out there, and and um, getting a job that's going to give you a lot of responsibility early on, where you're going to just be the one who's going to be responsible for doing things, whether it's a local prosecutor's office, whether it's a state environmental protection agency where you're going to be doing the, doing the cases or a state AG's office, or a state labor department, where you're going to do wage and hour stuff, but you'll be the one actually doing those cases. It is great. It's a great, great training ground. And plus, you might get to find an area that you really love, you know, where you, you know, generally speaking, when um, government is doing that uh, proactive, um, affirmative work, um, as I call it, you're protecting people in some fashion or another, protecting the environment in some fashion or another, and you can feel really good about what you're doing as well. So I, I really encourage, you know, I've done, I've done days at law schools where students sign up and they sit with me for 20 minutes and I, invite, I look at their resume and I tell them, you know, all the opportunities are out there, but you've now, you've now saved all that time. <laughs> because really, they just, you know, um, get out there and, 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 it, and look, you can, you can do it in New York, you can do it in Washington, you can do it in LA and San Francisco too, but there's a lot of need around the country and then you become an expert and you're going to be the person that people will look to with, uh, with respect to this particular area and um, your reputation will grow. And you know, when I was in Vermont, I picked a few areas. I, I was blessed with having um, attorneys general who loved the work I did and gave me a lot of freedom, and I focused on pharmaceutical issues, I focused on tobacco issues, I focused on advertising issues, and I, was, I became a national leader on a lot of those, those issues. And so that's the quick version. It's really cool. Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah, uh, we have, great question. We have, we have time for a couple more <coughs> over here, yeah. Um, I was wondering um, what the FTC is doing about coordinating privacy issues with other similar bodies in other jurisdictions and now from Europe and especially due to the transnational nature of a lot of companies who are facing very similar issues and have kind of our own regulatory systems as well. Sure. Um, so the question was what are we doing in working with our counterparts in other parts of the world? around privacy, particularly Europe, but, but elsewhere. And also a great question. All these questions have been great. Um, we um, uh, work a great deal with our counterparts around the world on privacy. We actually do that in a lot of different areas. We do it in the competition area, too. But in privacy in particular, we've done a lot of work um, with other countries, um, both uh, in terms of enforcement. You know, we developed, in fact, my attorney advisor, Yael Weinman, who's sitting over here, um, developed the Global Privacy Enforcement Network, which was um, an effort um, by um, us to enhance communications among privacy regulators about particular cases that they're working on. Um, we're also very active in the, uh, let me see if I'm going to get this right, the International Privacy and Data Protection Association or group, where all of the world's um, privacy and data protection authorities are within one umbrella organization. Uh, we were recently admitted to that group. The United States had not been admitted to that group for a while, but we have now been admitted to that group. That was that happened last year, and just within a year, we've developed um, some uh, very key relationships within that group. There's a lot of dialogue going on where people are really listening to what we have to say, and we're really listening to what they have to say. 
And we've also been given a few leadership um, positions within that group. So I think that our role in the international privacy regulator community has, has just grown and been um, uh, developing rapidly over the past few years. We're also very active in um, APEC. Um, APEC has a whole dialogue going on around accountability issues and trying to develop mechanisms that are, in a way, they're self-regulatory with, with a, a potential enforcement arm to back them up, but a self-regulatory way for um, companies to demonstrate that they're being responsible with data and that um, they're using data appropriately so that they can transfer data across borders. So there's a big, big effort that we're involved with with respect to APEC. There's a lot of other work we're doing, too, but those are just some examples. Um, it is very important to us to have those lines of communication open um, between us and other regulators so that we have an understanding about what each other are doing on the enforcement front, and we also have an understanding of what are the effects of rules that we might put in place for companies that are crossing borders. Um, I'm, I'm curious what are uh, perhaps specific examples of individuals along the lines of the TOR project who have successfully developed technologies or approaches to protect their own privacy and perhaps turned it into a program or an application um, from your perspective as a commissioner of that. So I, um, you know, people have told me when I got to this position I should never get, I should never allow myself to say I don't know. But I, I don't, I, I honestly don't agree with that. I think it's it's um, very important and refreshing for people to occasionally say that they just are not, I, I'm not sure I'm aware of what you're talking about, so I apologize. <laughs> I would like to be able to offer you an opinion of what I think about it, but I would need more information about it. Sounds good. All right, we've got one or two more questions right here. Or I'm not a student. Okay. No, no, it's only a like continual. Just the first one, just the first one. Just the first one. I'm, I'm from PayPal. Oh. Um, yeah, so my question is around uh, sort of the confluence of security and privacy um, and the recognition that um, basically there's a, a very asymmetric nature of the conflict between criminals and those in, in, uh, in industry like PayPal and others and law enforcement who are attempting to thwart their actions, <coughs> fraud, account takeover, etc. Um, and we, um, we, we spoke with uh, several commissioners in uh, Europe um, around, and one of the issues, uh, one of the examples we gave was the Sony data breach last year. 100 million accounts taken over. Most of the account user IDs were email addresses. <coughs> Those 100 million uh, accounts with their passwords were out in the criminal network in seconds. The industry had never cracked them. We didn't get a hold of them, but had we been able to share them, with perhaps some safe harbor protections. We could have done things like when you come into to PayPal with a, an account that is known to be compromised, mm -hmm. we would then say, oh, what, what, what was your first dose? Right? Answer one of these security mm -hmm. questions. That would actually enhance consumers' privacy and protections, but it requires that we be able to exchange some information. Some would argue it is the I think not. But, how, how can we balance those things and do so in a way that respects the individual's rights to privacy, but also allows industry and others to take actions that enhance their privacy by exchanging that type of information right. and for limited uses? Right. Um, so, uh, you know, you started out by saying, you know, privacy and data security are, are intention. Well, and, and yeah. I, we don't. We actually don't believe that. Right, and I, I was going to say that I actually I don't believe that either. I actually think that um, in many ways they're two sides of the same coin. Yes. And so many of the principles that enhance data security also enhance privacy. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, again, leaving aside the government issue that we were talking about a, a little while ago, data minimization, data retention, rules around that, um, I think are uh, both privacy protective and security protective. Um, so I do think that they are, to a great extent, um, uh, answering the same questions and leading to similar results. Um, you know, I, I hear you loud and clear about, well, there might be some instances where industry can actually help with protecting consumers more in the context of a, of a data security 
um, breach. And I think that generally speaking, um, regulators, and, I, and I'm speaking now from my experience as a state <coughs> enforcement person, a longtime state enforcement person before I got to the commission, who dealt with data security issues and data breach notification issues. I think that um, regulators have worked pretty closely with some key players within the financial payment system, shall we say, um, to uh, either find out the extent of harm, to find out the nature of the security breach, um, and to get other information. So I do think that there's cooperation. Now, in the particular instance that you're mentioning, maybe there wasn't um, a solution that, that um, there wasn't the solution that you've proffered might have been more helpful. But I do think there's a recognition among regulators that there are some key, uh, you know, uh, uh, pivot points um, or pivoting players in the financial system that can be very helpful in terms of finding out what happened and perhaps enhancing security going forward once there's a breach. Okay. I, we have to end it here, unfortunately, everyone. I'm sorry, but uh, you know, please join me in thanking the commissioner.